to the cloud. We are currently recording. Good, good, good. All right. And I am going to share screen. Are you all now able to see welcome? Yes. 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 Take a second and talk to me about that font size. Is that legible? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The what? It's fine mm -hmm. for me. The size yep. of the letters. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. Good. You can right. read this, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, just a sec. I'm just, I'm expanding my, I have, I'm working on a double screen here, and I'm expanding my second screen so that I can see all of you. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's just go over a little bit of Zoom protocol. Uh, if you are the only people in your house and there's every reason to think you're going to enjoy a fair amount of peace and quiet, you're welcome to leave your microphone on. If, if you think you're, you're not going to be saying much or you've got, you know, kids or dogs or telephones ringing a lot, uh, just remind yourself that at the bottom left, uh, you can mute yourself and then unmute yourself. Okay. Um, uh, we are a small enough group that I can mostly see if people just wave their hands if they want to say something. If, if I don't uh, catch it, um, uh, you can go to the bottom of your screen um, and there is a little button for indicating uh, that you want to type a memo or a note and, and, and type something in and people will see, hey, you know, Trish really wants to talk or hey, Kathy has something to say or whatever. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, welcome to Bible Witness, learning and sharing the good news. Uh, it is uh, first appropriate that I thank uh, Cindy, who was actually the one who came up with this idea. She and I put a lot of work into this together, so thank you, Cindy. Um, and uh, the title is something that I may have put the final shape of it, but it was a series of Lego blocks. We moved around a lot. Um, because we wanted to emphasize a couple of things. The word witness there in Bible witness is intended to have a double meaning. Um, the Bible is a witness and the Bible calls us to witness. And so that's why we have as a subtitle, learning and sharing the good news. Um, uh, Lutherans uh, are, by, uh, wait just a sec, someone's entering the waiting room, just a sec. I don't know who it is, but we're gonna let them in. <laughs> Lutherans have not always been terrific at sharing the good news. Uh, now, there are a variety of ways to doing it. The point of this course is not that we all learn how to knock on doors and ask people if they've, uh, if they've read the Bible recently, but, but Lutherans often have not been especially good at being able to share what it is that the Bible means to them. And so they have often, if I may use a military metaphor, they've often yielded the battleground to fundamentalists and biblical literalists who, when we come along and say, well, there's some different ways of reading the Bible, tend to treat us as though we don't take the Bible seriously. Um, and uh, if you ever want to just check on how seriously we take it, sometime look in the back of our worship book. Uh, and there are several pages that list how everything that we, almost everything we do in the worship service is a direct quote or a paraphrase from scripture, right? Um, Pound for pound, minute for minute, our worship services, like Roman Catholics and Episcopalians, are just saturated with God's Word. All right? So, uh, and the other part of uh, uh, what Cindy and I were working on is that we wanted to make sure to put up our key information, uh, our website, uh, how to get to our worship services online, and our phone number, so that if we begin to invite people to this, people will know how to connect with the congregation in a time of COVID. So my absolute encouragement to all of you is to reach out to people whom you know and say, hey, why don't you come try this? Could be adult children, could be friends. It's perfectly okay if it's people from other congregations, but this is an effort to do a little bit of evangelizing here in the time of pandemic. Any questions about all that? So you, you are put it out on YouTube and then we can share it from there. Yes, yes. Yeah, ultimately I will put this, it's going to take me, you know, a practice or two, but sometime this week I will get this Zoom meeting on YouTube um, and people can go and look at it. So you could share the link with people and say, you know, the pastor's not much to look at, but I'm there too, you know, like that. <laughs> All right? Okay. Um, 
I am going to take us to the next screen. Can everybody okay. see Bible Witness? Yes. Yes. Okay, so class number one, did I get the day right? No, I didn't. <laughs> it's the 11th. Yeah. It's the 11th. I, I, I think in terms of Sundays. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, there's no way around it. You've all taken classes before, and you know that the first day, you actually spend the least amount of time down in the weeds, right? If you're going to take a class on church history, the first day, you're not going to get very far. And that's certainly true today. Today, we're going to set up and learn a lot of sort of high altitude, bird's eye things about scripture. We'll look at a little bit of scripture, but today's just sort of big picture stuff, okay? So um, I, I've posed an opening question, what is the Bible? Um, and then take a second, if you would, and look at those and see if those uh, are some of the answers you've heard or perhaps had or thought of. And then let's talk about them for a second. Are these, are these ideas that are out there in the culture? Are these things you've thought of? Are these answers perhaps partly true? What do you think? Sure. Yeah. Somebody give me a full sentence. I thought I always thought of it as a history book because okay. it gave me a picture of how the people of different times saw their own lives and their their purpose in them right so could we say partly true or yeah. true in some places does that mm -hmm. make sense to people i think i think that's a i think that's a good answer michelle i think uh george i'm going to get you next uh i think i think there are chunks of the bible that are history uh, i'm not expecting anybody to know a lot about the bible this class but can anybody point me to a place where you think there's some history in the bible where there'd be no challenge to it. It's just sort of obvious. Exodus? Yeah, right? There's a pretty basic story there. If there were no Israelites and they really never left Egypt, we have a problem, right? Um, it would seem to me same with uh, St. Paul's letters. They're full of history, right? Paul talking about people he knows and places he's going to and cities he's visiting, right? Okay, so that's fair. George, how about you? I was going to say the same thing might be true of the second bullet, because if you think about the Old Testament, there's uh, a fair amount of law there, and that law could be construed to be guidance for how to live. Yeah, partly true. There's, there are plenty of laws, commands, etc., right? Right? So partly that's true. Right? And uh, this is a bit of an advertisement for the men in the group, right? The men's breakfast, actually, in what, two weeks, uh, we'll actually be looking at the book of Proverbs, which is, full of, which is full of suggestions Better. for living a good life. Okay. What about this first one, God's rule book? What do you think? Are there any rules in the Bible? Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I mean, can't, can't we can't we really just can't we really just do that? Whoops. Can't we oh, really but... just do that? Partly true. Laws, etc. Right. Why would you say that 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 it's a problem if that's your if that's your go to? And let's just say, for both for whoops, no, no, no both for this and for the last one, and a guide to heaven. What's the problem if those are your go-to beliefs about what the Bible is? A rule book or a guide to heaven? What, anybody think of what problem you're likely to have or what difficulties you might encounter with the Bible? John? You're putting, you're putting emphasis on us, what, what we have to do. Excellent. Excellent. It seems to me that one of the real problems with the rule book or guidebook mentality is that it ends up turning the Bible into only work or only laws or only rules, right? And there's no way around this. This gets us into theology pretty quickly. Theology, right? Talking about God. If God is primarily a rule giver, right? At first, 
for sure some Christians think that's who God is. What, what's the big problem we have? I'm thinking specifically of the Gospels. What's the big problem we have reading the Gospels, the stories of Jesus' life, if God is primarily a rule book or guidebook kind of guy? There's no grace. There's no grace, right? Uh, would, would people uh, in this group be willing to go with me? Jesus shows mercy a lot of the time. <clears throat> what, what are Jesus' primary ministries? Teaching, healing, healing. exorcising demons, mm -hmm. raising from the dead, caring for the poor. It gets really hard to see what any of those mean if the Bible is primarily a guidebook or a rule book. And perhaps most importantly of all, all four of the Gospels spend a major chunk of their last three to ten chapters on what in Jesus' life? All four of the Gospels focus on what? The crucifixion and the resurrection. The, the, the arrest, the suffering, the dying, and the resurrection of Jesus. It gets really hard to explain how those are a guide or a rule book, doesn't it? Does that make sense to people? Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. Yes. I'm going to offer what I think are some better answers. Uh, and some of these will be new to some of you. Some of these you'll find very familiar. The first one there is something that uh, many people don't know, but I think it's lovely. Uh, if, you ha if you've ever been told what the word Bible means, what have you been told it means? The word Bible. Well, this is a good place. Oh, book. To book. I don't book. remember anything. <laughs> Has anybody ever been told that the Bible means the book? Yeah. Okay. Perhaps. Uh, I, I will just know. say, uh, if any of you ever have picked up a book where there's a list of books in the back, Anybody remember what that's called? The list of books. anthology, like an anthology. Nope. No. The list of resources in the back. Oh, the bibliography. The bibliography. Everybody hear the word, the little bibble in there? Mm -hmm. The yeah. bibliography is the list of bibles, the list of books. All right. Uh, Kathy, are you with us? I'm here. Okay. I just Kathy? I turned my video off for a second. No, no, you're welcome to leave it off. I want to draw on your knowledge. What's What's French for book? Leave. And where do you get books? What's a library? Bibliothèque. A bibliothèque, right? So Bible, biblios, right? This comes from the word for book. But what I think is important is to realize, this is my, my little point here, which is that what the, the word Bible actually comes from is the, a Greek word that is, and this is a little technical, plural and diminutive. Huh. In other words, the word somebody can. Hello, this is Janie. Oh, okay. Janie, we can hear you. I know, I'm sorry. I'm so okay. sorry. No, it's okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, <Can> you, <laughs> my screen minimized it. It's like, oh, great, fine. <laughs> sorry. I'm, oh, gosh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on. Mm -hmm. Janie? Oh, yeah. Janie, this is Pastor. Pastor. We can hear you, dear. I know. Can you mute me? Can you mute us? Can you mute yourself? Okay, I got it. <laughs> All right. Oh, Search in the 21st century. All right. So, <laughs> the little books is a really good translation, or even the little scrolls uh, for Bible. Just off, can I just ask, does anybody feel a little weight roll off your shoulders when you learn that the Bible is the little books? Yeah. Take yeah. the pressure off. Michelle, you're, you're laughing. You're, you're laughing. <laughs> I don't think of it as little, but <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> let, let me ask, if you took any one of the books of the Bible and tore the pages out and rebound them, how big would the book be? It'd be little, right? Even a big one like Genesis, you know, maybe 80 pages, 
right? Gospel yeah. of Mark, 25 pages. Book of Revelation, 20 pages. You know, can I just say, letter to the Philippians, single piece of paper. Yeah. It's a pamphlet, right? <laughs> yeah. so I just think it's, I think it's worth us remembering that until the book was invented, several centuries after Jesus, what people really had was some sort of, what libraries would have, would be essentially some sort of box with cubbies in it, and they would put scrolls in them. So you'd have a cubby that would have five scrolls in it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the cubby would say Moses books. And then way down here, you'd have a cubby, and it would say, you know, gospel. And you'd have a scroll for Matthew, and a scroll for Luke, and a scroll for... What's uh, somebody's creating a problem? Okay. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Does that make sense to put it? All right, I'm gonna try the second one here. Uh, this is our this is our Bible study word, a witness. What do you think it would mean to say that instead of the Bible being a guidebook or a rule book, the guidebook is primarily a witness? Well, let me ask. It, go ahead, George. I was going to say it's something that allows you to see, like a witness. Yeah, a witness allows you to see. I like that. In, um, in court, what is a witness's job? What's the job of a witness in court? Testify. To testify. To testify. This is whether it's this is what I saw or this is what I know, or this is what I've experienced, right? Let me just ask. I've never been in court, but I've watched way too much Law & Order. If you had 10 witnesses, would you expect them all to say exactly the same thing? You wouldn't. No. In fact, let me just ask. If 10 witnesses all said the same thing, what would you assume? They worked it out. They worked it out. In advance. Right? Yes. The reason I think this is so important is the idea that the Bible is a witness to God's love means that our, our first reaction when we find that it's complicated, that not all parts exactly agree with each other, that there are different perspectives, should not be to panic and try to fix it, but to recognize that we're looking at dozens, hundreds of witnesses over a period of something like two and a half thousand years, all right? And we ought to expect that there's going to be variety. All right. A witness to God's love, especially seen through Israel and Jesus Christ. Uh, that's a sort of a fancy way of saying, especially seen through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, uh, Right? The Old Testament is primarily the witness of God working through a particular nation. The, Old Te the New Testament is the witness of God witnessing, in fact, coming and participating through a single person. Does that make sense to people? Okay. Yes. I now would like to take you to two Martin Luther quotations that I have always loved. The first one is this. The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. Can anybody connect that to this idea of the Bible as a witness or the Bible as something that does something? What do you, what do you hear there? Come on. Anybody ever cried in church when they heard some passage of scripture, even once? Yeah. Anybody ever cried in church when they heard scripture? Yeah. yeah. What? Why? What happened? Because it spoke to me. Uh -huh. <clears throat> it spoke to you. And maybe laid hand lays laid hands on me. Yeah. Laid hold hold of me. One of the things I would most love if by the end of this class, 
instead of thinking that the Bible is something that we do to other people, right, or scripture is something that is a tool in our hand, we instead understood it as the scriptures, the Bible, is the place where God does things to us. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, uh, re re right, really the only, way, uh, the only way to share warmth with someone else is to touch them. That's how you share warmth. What scripture does is it shares God's gift. But in order to do that, you can't aim it at people like a gun, right? You, you can't treat the Bible as something to beat down other people with, right? The Bible has a gift to give, but it, it will do it in ways that surprise us. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, and again, I'll speak for myself. I know that I am especially good at listening to the Bible when my life has had a fundamental change in it. So I heard scripture especially well when my kids were born. I heard scripture especially well when my parents died, right? And I think there is this sense that, that scripture, can, scripture will do things to us and that really what we need to do is not go mine scripture with a pickaxe, but go to scripture seeing what, what God wants to do through it. So let me just ask, anybody have a favorite biblical verse? Or even just, you don't have to quote it entirely, a favorite place to go to in the Bible. I like Psalms and Proverbs because I understand them best. Yeah. Can I just ask, is there anybody here that, that goes, is there anybody here that doesn't like at least one psalm? Does everybody here like at least one psalm? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 23rd. The 23rd psalm, maybe. Some people, especially Lutherans, like the 46th psalm um, because it's where Luther gets a mighty fortress, right? Uh, a lot of people like, well, I mean, there are a bunch of them, but right? it's pretty rare to find that if you go to a psalm, it doesn't speak to you. Right. Okay. So that's the first book. The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. The second one, and this I think is so helpful if we, if we can understand this one. Luther said, in the Bible, you will find the swaddling cloths and the manger in which Christ lies. Simple and lowly are these swaddling cloths, but dear is the treasure Christ who lies in them. What would it mean to say that the Bible is simple and lowly wrap, wrapping cloth, but that what it holds is dear? Anybody sort of get a sense of what that might mean? Would it perhaps mean that they are just words and sentences? I mean, there's something that we deal with on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. They're essentially just words that are put together into sentences but it's the meaning that's constructed through the connection of those sentences into paragraphs and books and then books within books and connected to books. Yeah, Let, let's start with that. Does everybody see that anything you can do with any other paper you can do with a copy of the Bible? Right? I'm not suggesting any of these things, right? But you can wrap a present, right? You can line a bird cage, you can start a fire, right? I, I, I'm just saying, it's paper, right? And while while, of course, we, you know, I don't know about the rest, of, I, I treat my Bible with some care, and I've got some tabs in it, and it's personalized, and I keep notes in, right? But we recognize that they are, in some sense, just words. Let me just ask this. Um, do we all know, do we all know that there, have, that there are some people for whom the Bible doesn't mean anything? Mm -hmm. Right? You can read them a passage from the Bible, doesn't mean anything. And yet somehow to those of us for whom it really matters, it is the place where we find Christ, the dear treasure, the witness to God. Okay. Um, I was, I'm sorry. No, please. I was just thinking, I know people who, or I've been in conversation with people who get stuck on the simple and lowly words and yeah. kind of miss the gift of Christ because they want to rational out the, possibility that that was impossible or that's not the way it happened, but they missed the gift. Right, right. And I think that's a really good point. 
one of the things that I love uh, about the New Testament, which it's very hard to, you have to just have to know this because of course we're reading it in English. New Testament was written in what is commonly called common or even marketplace Greek. So there are, so for example, Paul was a good writer of Greek. The person who wrote Hebrew was a very good writer of Greek. You're, you're just going to have to take this on faith. But the Gospel of Mark is in really sort of sophomore year Greek. The Gospel of Mark is not written in very good Greek. The Gospel of John is written in incredibly simple Greek. It's good Greek, but it's very simple, right? People who want to go study Virgil and Homer and Aeneid, etc., when they come to the New Testament, find that they're looking at something fairly simple and lowly. It's not complicated. The man who taught me Greek was a classicist, right? He taught Greek and Latin for a living. And he said, the first time he sat down and read the Gospel of Mark, two things happened. One, it was very easy for him. He could just read it through. It wasn't hard Greek at all. And two, he said, I'm absolutely convinced that the person who wrote Mark's gospel was not writing in his first language, that he spoke some other language first, that this was his second language. Now, if our ideas about God are, <laughs> you'll excuse me, but God always has the best. God always works with the best materials. Everything that God ever does in the world is perfect and without error. If, if that's our litmus test for Scripture, then Scripture is going to be problematic for us. If, on the other hand, Scripture is simple and lowly, but dear in what it gives to us, then I think we're going to have a much freer time working with these little books. Right? Does that make sense to people? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I want to take a second and just uh, two pages, two minutes on this page, and I want to make sure that we all remind ourselves that, first of all, we are reading translation, right? And uh, there is no such thing as a perfect translation. Anybody, I mean, some of you I know have several languages, but anybody tell me why it's not possible? have a perfect translation? In some cases, a language doesn't even have that word. Yeah, there, right? There are, there, there, are, there are moves from one language to another where a, 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 the language you want to translate into doesn't have a word. Anybody think of any other problem? Humans wrote it and humans translated it. Sure, right? There's just going to be an imperfect process. Uh, is everybody familiar with the following expression? It's raining cats and dogs. Yeah, right. Sure. Sure. How do you translate that? Well, uh, if you have autism, you're an individual with autism, you would literally translate it that it's, there are cats and dogs coming from the sky. <laughs> right. Suppose, suppose you translate it into a language like all of the other languages where that isn't a thing. Right? I'm reasonably sure that Germans don't say it's raining cats and dogs in German. Right? I don't think the Spanish have an expression about gatos coming down. Yeah. Right? right. So what do, if you're the translator, what do you have to decide at that point? You have really, in a sense, you have, a, I would say, basically three choices. Raining cats and dogs. Does everybody see that one choice would be you could simply translate it it's raining cats and dogs, right? And then you'd have to have a footnote because the people reading it, what's the problem they're going to have? Makes no sense. Makes no sense to. <laughs> they don't understand the idiom. They don't understand the idiom. So one way would be to translate it word for words. Everybody see I'm way over on a margin here? Word for word, and then just say, well, they're not going to understand it, but at least they know what it says. At the other extreme, the other extreme would be an absolute paraphrase, like it's raining lots and lots. Now, notice that gets the idea across, but what's been lost? Excitement. 
right. The, the color, the, the color, the intensity, also, the intensity. And also, can I just say what's lost are the cats and the dogs, mm. right? So someone who wanted to read through your letter and see how many times you mentioned cats, <laughs> if you translate it's raining lots of lots, they won't know that you wrote cats there, right? And then there is a place somewhere in the middle where you try to find a balance, where you use as many of the words as you can, right? And so if you look at, does everybody see what I've got up on screen? I want you to see that there is a range. Now, we're not gonna spend all our time on this, but is everybody, can people see my arrow moving? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yes. over here, we have word for word, okay? Um, and that can be incredibly helpful. If you like the old King James Version, you don't have to give it up. The King James Version was in the KJV. Yeah, and that's the KJV, right? Mm -hmm. right? That's the one. Uh, peace to all of you. You know I love you. Anybody who's older than I am, anybody over 60, was probably brought up as a child on the King James Version. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. My children oh, yeah. were brought up on the RSV, the Revised mm -hmm. And my children were brought up, see there in the middle, the NRSV? Yeah. The NRSV. Really? Have any of you ever been reading the King James Version and noticed that words are italicized sometimes? Well, let's say that again. Uh, have you ever read, looked at a page of the King James Version and realized that some of the words are in italics? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. Most mm -hmm. people think that those are words you're supposed to <clears throat> emphasize, but it's strange because they're usually little words like his or are. And do you know what the truth is? The King James is so literal that whenever they put a word in that wasn't in the original language, they put it in a town. Mm. So what you're actually looking at in the King James, whenever you get italics, is a word that's not in the Bible. But that is, but that needs to be there for it to be in English. Okay, here's the reason I, I take the time to say this. There in the middle is what we tend to use here, the NRSV. That's what we hear in worship. Way out over here, you get the or the good news translation. My opinion, it's not that there's a right or a wrong answer about which one to use. I could bring you a stack. I own eight different translations of the Bible. But it's good to know what you're getting when you read from one Bible or the other. That this sense? is what I have. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I also think that being reminded that we're reading a translation takes one more weight off our shoulders. Because even if we take scripture incredibly seriously and we need to remind ourselves what we're reading is an effort to get it right, right? Sometimes you read a translation, you don't know what it means. The best thing to do is go find another translation. Maybe that will help. And it reminds us yet again, of course, God's Holy Spirit is in the mix. But this process of translating words and putting them in books is a very human process. And what I mostly fear is that people come to this book and they say, God said it, I'd better believe it, or I'm in trouble. Rather than God has worked through many people there is a gift set for me here, and I do not need to be afraid when I read this. Okay. Any questions about the translation stuff? Right. Here's how this course is going to work. We have 10 weeks. There may be a week or two where we need to move it or cancel a week. Um, I'm Depending on how pandemic shakes out, I may have a wedding before we get to the end of our 10 weeks, but we'll work that out as a group and I'll send out an email about it, okay? What Cindy and I worked out together was five problems or misconceptions or issues that often get in the way of people reading scripture and then five alternatives, all right? So 
So the goal of this Finley class is not to know everything in the Bible. If that was the goal of a 10 week class, we wouldn't be allowed to take break and we'd go 24 hours a day for 10 weeks. And then we'd realize we still didn't know everything in the Bible. No one knows everything in the Bible. Not least because even if you had the whole thing memorized, that doesn't have anything to do with the fact that the Bible has hands and feet and a mouth that chases after you and speaks a new word every time you come to it. Okay. But I do think this is a reasonable goal to gain some tools for a deepening engagement with God. In other words, if the goal of this class could be thought of in terms of this word. I thought it was my hearing aids. If the goal of this class could be uh, that we seek to deepen our relationship with God through listening to scripture, I think that would be really good. One point I want to make before we move on. Did anybody have any sense? Why do we believe? There are a hundred answers to this question. Why do we believe that God wants a relationship with us? Why do we believe that? There are a hundred answers. Why do you believe God wants a relationship with you? I've seen him at work when I wasn't trying. Yeah. God, if Michelle, may I paraphrase that? God showed up. Mm -hmm. God showed up when you weren't looking. Yeah. Anything else? God created us and wants to see us thrive. Yeah. Can I just say, what, what is Jesus' most common term for God? Father. Father. Right? Right? God creates. God wants a relationship. God wants, I like George's, God wants to see us grow, right? Are, is there any parent? Is there any godparent? Is there any aunt or uncle? Is there any babysitter who doesn't want to see the ones that they love grow? Okay? Okay. Um, here we go. So here is our first problem. So this is week one. The problem. Now we're not actually going to get entirely to the uh, to the solution uh, to the alternative to this today. But here's the first problem, and I've just called it in Bible times. Does anybody have a memory, probably an old memory, when you were a child? You were in a Sunday school class, or a vacation Bible school class, or and teachers would talk about back in the Bible times or back in biblical times, and you would be shown pictures of people from Abraham to St. Paul, all dressed basically the same. They all had on a robe and a rope belt, right? And they usually had that little thing that they actually never wore in the Bible that Muslims wear, right? The sort of the band here with the cloth that draped down the back. You all know what I mean, right? My sense is that many people think of the Bible, and I'm actually jumping to the second bullet here, that many people think of this, that the Bible is a single period of time, that there was a time called biblical times, and that it's our job to go back and make sure that we understand that everything that happened in biblical times, right, is all one sort of single thing. Let me put this in a, in a, in a way that's maybe even a little more sophisticated. One of the best preachers I ever uh, have studied under said that when he was a young pastor, he thought of the Bible as an incredibly large bucket of really good vanilla ice cream. And he thought for a sermon, you could take your scoop and take out a scoop of vanilla Genesis and a scoop of vanilla Romans and a scoop of vanilla Gospel of John and present it to people because the Bible said it. It's all from the Bible. And he said he now realizes that a much more useful way of thinking of the scriptures is this. You go into an ice cream store and there are 66 flavors. And they're all ice cream. 
and they're all delicious. And you can pick any scoops you want. What will happen when, let's just say, two people go in and they can pick three scoops? What's likely to happen? Are they likely to pick the same things? No. <laughs> can I just say, my favorite chapter in the New Testament is Philippians chapter 2. Could I get a show of hands, the number of other people here for whom Philippians 2 is their favorite chapter? It's my favorite flavor of ice cream. I love Philippians 2. I go to Philippians 2 when I'm sad. Because Philippians 2 says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. I love that scoop of ice cream. And I hope that sometime when we go into the Bible ice cream store, I can say, try a scoop of that. And you go, oh yeah, that's good, right? The reason I take the time to say this is, my sense is that the folks in our culture who are biblical literalists, get really uncomfortable when we say different parts of scripture are doing different things. And so if you take a look at my first bullet, this is one of my great concerns that most mainline Christians like you and me think we're not taking the Bible seriously because there are people out there saying that literalism is the right and only way to read all of scripture. And the terms that most usually get bounced around for that are these two words, infallible and inerrant. Anybody know what infallible means? Infallible <laughs> means not making a mistake. Making no mistakes, infallible, without error. And inerrant, of course, also, right? without error. So without failure or error. Why is that appealing? Why is that an appealing idea? It doesn't take any thought process. You just accept what's there. God bless you, God mattered. Right? All the thinking's been done for you. Yeah. Pastor, why aren't we letting women speak in church? Because there's one line in the later letters of Paul that says women must be silent in the sanctuary. And you just go like this. That's it. Bible said it. I believe it. That settles it. It's incredibly tempting, right? Because as Don just said, it doesn't take any thought at all, right? It becomes more problematic when, for example, we realize that in the book of Romans, that same Paul sends greeting to Phoebe, the deacon. So women could be deacons. I mean, I don't need to put too fine a point on this, but I can be as literal as the next person. Paul calls a woman a deacon. Well, so what is this about women not being allowed to lead? Right? Or doesn't Paul say, now in Christ there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, nor, nor Jew, but all are one in Christ. Well, okay. So, my point here is this, this literalism is incredibly comforting for some people. And, and I think you can hear, I have some energy around this. I'm tired of people beating me with the Bible. I'm tired of thinking that if they, if they say, well, I'm, you know, the Bible has it in it, I'm right. Right? Okay. So this, uh, this is our problem for the day. Does that make sense to people? This idea that the Bible is just a big scoop of vanilla ice cream. It's all the same. It's all from the same time. All right. In our last 10 minutes, I'm going to propose some alternatives. All right. So what, everybody see that there's a line in red? Okay. The red is the problem. It's from the previous screen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to offer an alternative to taking the Bible literally, and it's this, taking the Bible seriously. 
I would argue that people that, own, that take the Bible only literally are not taking it seriously. I want you to think about a relationship that you've had with a spouse or a child or a friend. If you took everything they said literally, what problem do you almost immediately run into? <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> Trouble. Trouble. Michelle Holub, church secretary, queen of the office. What what difficulty would you have if I was if you were required to take literally everything I said in the office? Well, I'd have to respond to that and then I'd get fired. <laughs> right, right. A fair amount of the stuff I say is silly or absurd or tentative or metaphorical or poetic or humorous or inquisitive, right? If Michelle took everything I said here in the office as a literal statement of fact, right? We'd actually have a very hard time communicating, right? Okay, so my proposal is let's take the Bible seriously. And that means literally when it's literal, right? To the letter, what literal means is by the letter, the actual letter. Let's take it metaphorically when it's metaphorical, right? When it poses a question, let's, let's take seriously that perhaps it wants us to think about the question. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? That is a great biblical question, Psalm 121, right? All right, Psalm 139. Lord, whither can I flee from thy spirit? Is there anybody on this call right now who at some point or another hasn't wondered where God was? Yeah. yeah. Right? The, the 139th Psalm says, Whither can I flee from thy spirit? And then it says, and then it says, There's nowhere I can go. The light and the dark are both alike to you. Right? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even then you are there. Does everybody see how odd it would be if we took the phrase, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, literally? That would just be weird. That's clearly an image. Okay, so I have three biblical quotations here. Um, and I'd like to ask... Are these best taken literally or in some other way? Let's actually look at the second one first. In fact, you know what? I, I just put them up in the order in which they appeared in the Bible. But let's do this. Take a look at that first one with me. As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. What would it mean to take that seriously? What kind of writing is that? I thought I heard somebody say metaphorical. Jean, was that you? Yes, yeah. I believe so. Yeah, it's a, it's right. It's, it's a metaphor or it's an image. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. some, remember earlier we paraphrased raining cats and dogs to raining lots and lots. Could someone paraphrase this for us? As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. Among the trees. Could it mean men. that it's fruitful? Yeah, yeah. Could it have to do with fruitfulness? What else could apple tree compared to trees have to do with? Be that I'm sorry, Janie, again, please. A tree that offers nourishment? Uh, yeah, yeah. How about he nourishes me? Okay. If you've ever read Song of Songs, you know it's a racy book. It's the only book in the Old Testament that doesn't mention God. The rabbis, uh, the early rabbis were split. Some said it didn't belong in Scripture. Some said it was the most profound book in all of Scripture. But at the very least, it is full of racy language. Would you allow me just for a moment to suggest that one possible paraphrase of that is my guy is juicy. <laughs> right? 
my my guy's better looking than all the other guys. He is mm -hmm. sweet. My guy is sweet. Okay. What about the second one? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That one's a little harder. You all know where that's from, right? From Genesis. Adam and Eve are told not to eat up the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What do you think? That's Adam and Eve. anybody see why there's why it's difficult it, it is clearly a part of the story does everybody see what's difficult about saying it's literal it's literally true well today we we wouldn't understand that type of tree we don't have such a tree yeah has it, can i just ask has everybody anybody ever seen a tree like that a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, can I just ask, at some point or another, haven't most of us heard somebody try to tell us what the tree was? It was an apple tree, it was a pomegranate tree, right? Right. Everybody see built right into that effort is an effort to say, well, it obviously can't just be a tree of the knowledge of good. What does that even mean? This, I, right? George Freestone has planted a tree of enthusiasm for the New York Mets. <laughs> what, does, what does that even mean? Right? Cindy Mattern has planted a tree of the love of horses. <laughs> how, do you, how do you plant a tree of the love of horses? Right? right? How do you plant a tree of knowledge of good I guess my point is this. It probably needs more than Bob said it. I believe it. That settles it. We probably need to talk about why the knowledge of good and evil is tempting to human beings to make some sense of that. All right. All right. Take a look at the third one. Jesus began to weep. This is right before he raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus began to weep. What do you think? Weep for joy. Literal. I think that's literal. Yeah. Now, yeah. Can we say that there's meaning in it? For sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, the fact that Jesus is crying over a man he knows he's about to raise from the dead, that tells us all sorts of things about Jesus. But it's also pretty clearly not a symbol or an image or a metaphor. That passage means there was a man named Jesus, and he hadn't been crying, and then he began to, and then he did it. Jesus began to weep. That's what it means. Does that make sense to people? So I'm, I'm trying to take us from something that is purely metaphor to something that is sort of a complex idea to something that really is quite literal. This is sort of what you got to do to read scripture, right? And Don had it exactly right. For sure, it is more work than just saying everything in scripture is vanilla. Right? Okay. We are down to our last five minutes. And so... I'm, I'm going to admit before we go, the next page is a little scary. I'm just telling you in advance, okay? So the third, I, the, 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 uh, the idea there is scripture as a single era. Remember we talked about that, the idea in Bible times? This is what I'd like to show you instead. This is the entire Old Testament. Just take a look at the dates on the right-hand side. Hmm. First of all, the earliest date that I'm even willing to offer tentatively is what? 1650 BC. Okay, now I didn't bother to the approximation line because basically all but one or two of these dates are completely approximate. With Genesis, of course, there are people who have gone back and counted the ages of everybody who's listed, and they can tell you that the Bible goes back five and a half thousand years or whatever, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but the point is, we don't really know how back it goes. We, we know that the stories that we have of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Rachel and Leah, we, oh, there's Eileen Teeter. 
I've been here all the time. I couldn't, I was afraid to touch anything or I'd lose you. <laughs> I still can't see me. Okay, well, glad well, you're here. Um, okay, so uh, would someone just for a second tell me how far from us is 1650 BC? 3,600 years. 36, 37. 36, almost 3,700 years. Right. Almost. 3,670 years or whatever, right? Okay. I just, I need you to think about how far that back, about how far back that is. If you got to Martin Luther, you'd still have more than 3,000 years to go. Okay. If you got to St. Augustine, you'd still have two and a half thousand years to go. I mean, it's just, it's, okay. And so th the point of this page is not to teach you the entire Old Testament, because we don't have time for that. But just to say, a whole lot goes on in the Bible. There are early encounters with God. There's the promise of a nation. There's the Exodus. There are four more books where God provides a pattern. There's what is usually called the time of the judges. I'm not, I'm not being judgy with any of you. Can I just get a, a, a show of hands? How many people here off the top of their head could name three stories from the time of the judges? Some of you, I'm not going to make you do it. How many people think they could list three stories from the times of the judges? I bet George okay. could. I'm not going to make it, but I bet George could. Maybe. How long is the time of the judges? Time of the judges. Everybody see? How long, how long roughly is the time of the judges? 200 years. 200 years. I want you to think what's happened in the United States since 1820. And now I want you to realize that's how big a chunk of time it is in scripture. And most of us can't name anything that happened in it. The point is not to make us feel bad, but to recognize these are the these are eons rolling by, right? Right? A century is a drop in the bucket in scripture. And my point is not that it should make us feel worse, but rather that we should recognize when I said that there were like 65 flavors in the Bible ice cream store, I was way underselling that. There are 10,000 flavors. Right? There are so many stories. There's so much going on. So we get the books of Samuel, Chronicles, Kings, and we get almost 500 years of kings. Saul, David, Solomon, Solomon's son, time when they're a single nation, time when the nations split, time when nations go into exile, times when they come back. Right? Thousands of stories over hundreds of years. And then, just to remind <coughs> ourselves, the New Testament then, the New Testament then goes from a much smaller period of time, but still a period of time of over 100 years. So even to talk about New Testament times is a little misleading. Is anybody really comfortable saying that the period from 1920 to today is a single period of time? How would you break up, just in American history, how would you break up 1920 to right now? Oh my gosh. 1920s? Jazz. The decades? 30s? Depression, World War I. World War II. World War II. 50s? Korean War, right? The great the growth of American industry. 60s? Vietnam. Vietnam, yeah. protest. Nixon, whatever, 70s, well, you start 80s, now we're in living memory, 90s, the thousands, I would describe that as post 9-11, right, 2010s, I would describe as the Obama and then Clinton, uh, the Obama and then uh, Trump era, right, all, all of that's in 100 years, okay, the, old, the New Testament most people now think that the year they thought Jesus was born, he was probably a couple years older. But it doesn't matter a lot. It's perfectly fine to say Jesus was born in 1 AD. I don't care. Um, you can't say 0 AD because there is no 0, right? It goes from 1 BC to 1 AD. Um, uh, but his crucifixion and resurrection, 30 years later, the first writings of the New Testament are not the Gospels. 
Paul writing in the 50s and 60s. The Gospels aren't written until the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Probably. Best guess. And then the rest of the New Testament, late first century, some scholars would say the last couple of things might have been written in the very early second century, but big period of time. All right. The last thing, and then we're going to stop because we're coming on to an hour here quickly. Uh, the third problem we said with in Bible times is that it locates God primarily in the past. If we're really focused on in Bible times, we end up putting faith in the Bible rather than in the faith of the God who's witnessed to in the Bible. And this, I think, is crucial. And this, for me, is really, if you've got anything out of this hour, this is really where you get to cash in your chips. If instead of saying that what the Bible does is tell us facts about the past, we instead say that we, the Bible allows us to locate God in the present moment. The Bible is the Holy Spirit doing God to us. So that when you go to the Bible for comfort and you read a psalm of comfort and you cry, that isn't a manufactured experience. That is God doing comfort through the scriptures. And that's not random. These things were brought together into the books for a reason, because they're a faithful witness. Does that make sense to people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would love it. I would love it if you could practice getting to the Bible and not saying, essentially, what's the Bible going to tell me to do or be? But reach a point where you realize that every time you pick this up, you're picking up basically a wrapped present. And when you take the wrapping off, when you open it up and begin to read, there is a gift being given. Okay. Of course, I can't actually make you do homework, but I'm going to suggest some things that will get you ready for the next one. I would love it if you take a couple minutes. I'm not asking you to do this in your head. Feel free to open the Bible up. Make a list of as many genres or types of writing as you can find in the Bible. Can anybody just, to get us started, can anybody just think of a couple that we've mentioned today, a couple types of writing we found in the Bible? History. Letters and poems. History. George, I heard poems. So is there something else? Letters. Letters. History. Letters. Poems. Metaphoric writing. Yeah. Where, where, for example, do we find a lot of metaphorical writing in the Bible? We, we mentioned these a couple times. Uh, maybe you've heard of this metaphor. I don't know. The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? Yeah. 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 The songs, the songs. That's a whole type right there. They're songs, right? The one other one I'll give you from today is we spent a lot of time talking about there are laws in the Bible. A law is a type of writing, right? Okay. And then I would say, ask yourself how some of them should be read. For example, usually laws are be to a law. Usually laws are to be understood literally. Right? If the officer pulls you over and says you were going 70 in a 55, you will not get into that thing. I thought that was a suggestion. I was taking it metaphorically. <laughs> you say, well, this is literally a trick. And we literally want some of your money. Right? Okay. So that would be a place to go. And then what we're going to do next week is we're going to go to some specific passages in the Bible and see what fruit comes out of reading them seriously, which sometimes means literally and sometimes means something else. Okay? And I believe if Cindy will uh, say this, and Cindy, you can nod if I get this right, she would say, please don't keep this class a secret. Go tell somebody. Tell them that if they email us at the church office, we'll give them the link. Send them an email with the link yourself. Um, invite them to watch our worship services. Uh, and uh, remind them that Advent can touch their lives in all sorts of ways, even in a time of pandemic. Anybody want to say any? Uh, Cindy, did I get that about right? 
That's perfect. I've been muted the whole time, but yes, thank you. Anybody want to say anything else? Anybody have any burning questions from today? Anything that they didn't get that they want to make sure they ask about? All right, let's wrap up here. Uh, if anything occurs to you that you want to ask, give me a call or send me an email during the week. Um, uh, my deep hope is that I'll see all of you and a few more folks next week. Uh, and um, I think we'll wrap it up there. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a good one. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Hey, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs>